its inception in 1961, the Daily Express International Offshore Power Trade has won for itself a reputation which is worldwide. Sir Max Aitken has competed in every race since the first, and once again in August 69, his big diesel-powered gypsy girl was at Cowes. And as scrutineering got underway at Souter's Yard, speculation on the possible results ran high. Well, I think the race will probably be a result between the Americans and the Italians. They've got the fastest boat, and they're very formidable. Uh, they're well driven and uh, beautifully prepared. We, we, we treat our boats rather as pleasure boats. They treat theirs as pure racing boats. And good luck to them because they're fantastic. I think the people who race the Italians will come over here, the Italians will come over here, and the Americans come over here are great sportsmen. I hope they do very well. But the Italians and Americans were not the only foreign visitors. From South Africa, K.R. Stevens, Meteor 3, number 250, and Conrad Runchen's Lucy, number 911. But it was the entry of the reigning world champion, Don Arano, that in every sense rated number one. This is the so-called cigarette, uh, an American-built boat, and we have two 475-horsepower Merck cruises in it. Uh, she has a speed of over 70 miles an hour. It's got a fairly good record this year. It's won uh, six races. Uh, we're hoping we can hold together and we don't have any mechanical failures. Competition is uh, going to be good here. You have a, uh, one of the largest fields uh, we've ever run against. Out of a total entry of 75 boats, 53 were to survive the pre-race hazards of scrutineering and last-minute snags. Amongst the major personalities present, Peter Twist, one-time holder of the World Airspeed record. Well, this is one of the uh, biggest talky race entries I've ever uh, been involved in, and uh, we're racing a team of four Ford-powered huntsmen, uh, which are the same boats we had in the Round Britain race. And the sort of weather we're looking for is um, will be a reasonable wind, probably something in excess of force four, certainly, to give us some advantage over the faster, smaller boats. To scrutineer efficiently such a mammoth field in one day is itself a major achievement. It called for meticulous application by Tony the Needle Needell and his hawk-eyed team. For their principal consideration in such a long open water race has to be for the safety of competitors whose enthusiasm might outrun their discretion. In addition, of course, the technical requirements of entry for the valuable class awards must be cross-checked. Don Shedd's latest design, Miss Enfield, number 401, was of particular technical interest. The boat I'm sitting on now is a welded aluminium boat, um, and it's a development of last year's race-winning boat, Telstar, which was designed to Tommy Stop. It's identical in hull shape to another boat called T2, and both of these differ from previous boats which I've designed in having twin engines. This particular boat has got twin Mer cruisers of 475 horsepower each. The T2 has got two Daytonas of approximately 550 horsepower each. Um, the boats are quite a lot bigger than Telstar, being 33 foot long instead of 25. And we hope quite a bit faster, particularly in rough water. The maximum speed of the boats this year has taken a colossal jump from last year and it, it looks as though you have to be right in the 70s to be in the hunt. Miss Enfield then to defend the reputation of British design. But several leading British powerboat men elect to buy American. John Kennelly's Maltese Magnum Twin is a good example. He bought her from Don Arano shortly after the 1967 Torquay race and has been an active campaigner ever since. We've had a busy two weeks getting it ready for the race. We've, since we last had it out, it took a bit of a bashing, and uh, we had a lot of rudder problems, so we've managed to hang the rudder two foot over the stern of the boat on its own little frame, which is quite neat and seems to work. Makes the boat a bit smoother ride, uh, and run well in the rough wind. We're looking forward, I think, to a little bit of rough, because the American boat just seem to be going too quick in the car. And although we can run up to about 70, um, they seem to be running nearer the 80 mark. Uh, we won't, of course, run 70 at the start of the race because we're carrying a full load of fuel. 
about 400 gallons and it's uh, one of the longest races in the world series um, she uses 70 80 gallons an hour which uh, <laughs> is why we don't take her out for pleasure run <laughs> problems of steering weight sea keeping power and the sordid question of lsd but the ever-present unknown factor of offshore racing in british waters is the weather Well, T2 this year is a little bit bigger than Telstar was last year, so we can do with rather heavier going. We've got a little more wind now than we had this morning, but I'm afraid it's from the north. We've got to have it rough because we know that both the Italians and the Americans have got faster boats than we have, and they've got more reliable sustained speed. But I hope that uh, if we get a little bit of a blow, we can at least give them a run for their money. Unfortunately, the trick we played last year of going uh, hedge hopping around the top of Lime Bay, too many people know about that now. And of course, with the wind in this direction, you don't get the same advantage anyway. So, if you'll organize the weather, I'm afraid I'm scared of the briefing. Tommy Sopwith wasn't the only one at the briefing interested in the weather forecast. Max Aitken bids the entry a competitor's welcome. So, we go in for six, we go in for seven, unless there's a gale warning on the course or over the course. And I want to make that quite clear. Again, I welcome you on behalf of the Express, and I hope that. Uh, 010 comes in first. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming. But as usual, the Navy was there to put an end to doubt and speculation, at least as far as the Met was concerned. So the forecast for tomorrow, period 10 to 2100 local time. The wind, northerly, force 4. The sea phase was a northerly wind, slightly moderate. At the wind height of two and a half to three feet, possibly three and a half feet at times in the east, especially in the afternoon. And a swirl with an offshore wind which has been blowing for near the last week, negligible. In fact, the morning of race day was much as forecast. Conditions by no means perfect for spectators did not deter the crowd at cows, and the knowledgeable were out early for one of the finest free shows of the South Coast holiday season. And with spectators much in mind, a new start procedure. First, westwards across the Royal Yacht Squadron line, two port hand marks onto the reciprocal course, and off to South Sea. A dog leg round the North Sturbridge buoy, then back down the Solent, past cows again, and away. Brave Borderer stands off to shepherd the fleet to a 20-knot rolling start. 53 helmsmen watch her, 53 navigators the squadron yard off. And they're off to a good start at a cracking pace with 238 miles to go. Showing well at the start, Red Tornado of Italy with former world champion Vincenzo Balestrieri at the helm. But last year's duelists, the Gardner brothers, Sir Fury and Tommy Sopwith T2, were at it again. Sir Fury is challenged by Don Shedd's Ms. Enfield and Balestrieri and Red Tornado. And Balestrieri noses out to the front. But number one, Don Araner and the Cigarette in the leading bunch beat Sopwith T2 to the first mark. Balestrieri rounds the west leap and we remember his great duel of last year with Sir Fury, which ended when he sank in the deep water of Lyme Bay. But now the organizer's idea of a closed circuit type start pays off in full as the fleet turns to roar in towards the Isle of Wight shore. The sheltered water of the Solent is lashed and torn by the 70 mile an hour wake of the leaders, and behind them it's a lively ride for all and sundry. hand again round the Gurnet ledge off Yarmouth and the heading is due east and eight and a half nautical miles for the South Sea Mark boat. Meteor 3, the powerful South African catamaran, lies a handy seventh but not for long. She shares a prop to become one of a surprisingly high number of early retirements. But the big heavy weather boats like Max Aitken's Gypsy Girl forge on and bide their time. The South Sea Mark. And averaging 66 miles an hour from the start, it's Don Shedd with his brand new Miss Enfield making the pace for Balestrieri and Red Tornado. 
third and fourth, and well in touch, Don Arano and the cigarette, and Francesco Cosentino's white tornado. Then comes the gallant veteran Sir Fury with the Gardner brothers hanging on to hold a pace too hot for their taste. John Kennedy's Maltese Magnum twin is six, her twin Mercruisers of a thousand horsepower unable to make up for the improvements in hull design incorporated in the newer boats that head her. Seventh is Little Melodrama, the 25-foot outboard, once again leading her class in the skilled hands of John Galliford and Mike Camp. Then comes the Swedish boat with the most un-Scandinavian name, Count Stenbroker's Arano-designed Tam O'Shanter, just ahead of John Beard's incredible multi-hull Valari II, which had lost time with a loose engine hood. The second Gardner family boat, Delta, driven by the sons of the Sapiri crew, had been lengthened with a strange bolt-on proboscis to improve her plane. She was now involved in a private duel with the surviving South African boat, Runchen's Lucy, disputing 13th place. The local boat screwdriver is one of the lowest fired craft in the race. She duels with her old rival Ken Cass's tow motor, and the pair are still quick enough to be well in the first third of the fleet, ahead of the damaged and restarted Meteor 3, now running on any one of her twin Holman and Moody. Gypsy Girl now lays 17, averaging 43 miles an hour, ahead of number 29, the Earl of Normandy's Black Panther. And closing on Gypsy Girl's wake, her old rival, the Honourable Edward Greenall's G, about to join an epic race-long duel for the diesel prize. By now, the fleet was spread over several miles, thinned out by the pace of the leaders, but still highly by individual duels for every yard and wave crest of the film. From South Sea to the North Turbridge Boy is two and a half nautical miles. A starboard turn there led to a line of sight run of just over six nautical miles to cross the mouth of the River Medina and the Royal Yacht Squadron Line for the third time. A sudden buzz of excitement at Cowes and the leader was in sight. And it was still Miss Enfield with Don Shedd setting the pace with a boat as yet untried in any race, let alone this distinguished company. But shattering him close and with his British navigator Clive Curtis came Don Arano and the dagger shape of the cigarette poised to strike. Third now, Constantino's white tornado and fourth, the gardener's Sir Fury for Balestrieri had broken a drive shaft. John Kennelly's Maltese Magnum twin now fifth was nevertheless five minutes behind the leader. Melodrama, the leading outboard, was sick and holding her own despite the chop now beginning to build up. John Beard's Valari was making up for his earlier delay and had gained no less than seven places since he last crossed the squadron line. He was now seventh and still gained. Behind him, eighth, Another meteoric climb through the feet had been achieved by Tim Powell and Norman Barclay with Euclid. The Earl of Normanton's Black Panther had also gained places and shaken off Gypsy Girl. But the best the leading 14 boat, Harvey and Twist with Port Sport could do, was 24. Down to the Scots, a mile off Yarmouth Pier and across to her. And still Don Shedd and Miss Enfield in the lead, their average speed building up again now to 65 miles an hour from 63 at car. We began to ask ourselves if the aluminium hull was to prove itself a first-time out winner. But Don Arano and the cigarette were perilously close to the sole British hope, and the American world champion had quietly declared his intention to play a waiting game. Constantino too, with White Tornado, was shadowing Arano in third place. And then came a further blow to British hope. Sir Fury, lying fourth at Anvil Point, suffered a disintegrated alternator drive. Broken bits jammed the drive to the main engine cooling pump, and the Gardner brothers had had it. John Kennelly and Maltese Magnum found themselves promoted fourth. John Galliford and Mike Campbell, as well as leading the outboard, 
now lay fifth overall with Melodon. But now the open sea work there ahead. So far there had naturally been no sign of the predicted five foot wave and even the course ahead was protected by the shoreline from the northerly wind. Nevertheless, there was still better than 160 nautical miles to go and the casualty list might be. Here, Sea Bear gives up the unequal struggle off Anvil Point. Crossing Christchurch Bay, Don Arano opened the tap and the cigarette cleared Portland Bill with only white tornado in touch. Third now, Kennelly's Maltese Mason twin for Don Shed and Miss Enfield were out of the hunt with steering gear trouble. Ahead of number 350, Timo Mackinnon's Avenger 2, winner of the Round Britain race, were Melodrama, now fourth, and Tim Powell and Norman Barclay's UFO, fifth, having drawn ahead of Count Stenbilker's Tamashanta. Sir Max Aitken's Gypsy Girl had also gained ground in the open water for which she was designed, although like other rough weather boats, she could have done with a good deal more sea. In 11th place now, she still had number 185, Ted Greenall's G, right in her wake, in their race within a race for the diesel prize. Compare J.B. Hobart's Snoopy with the boats ahead of us, but Snoopy was a genuine attempt at power boat racing on a budget. Screwdriver and Black Panther were at grips on Portland, and although the sea state was in no way to be compared with last year's rollers off the headland, the notorious Portland race, the rocks, and the necessity to keep close in shore make this a remarkable grandstand for the Torquay race. Doing outstandingly well at this time was the inflatable psychedelic surfer, and although the course looked straightforward enough on the map, a broken compass was to ruin her performance. Don Arano brought the incredible cigarette to the Torquay turn at two minutes past 12 to average 66 miles an hour, or 58 knots, for the 116 nautical miles of the outward leg and a bare 46 minutes to cross line bay. Short of mechanical failure, he had the race sewn up. And so striking had been his domination that even the chances of a blow-up seemed remote. Seven minutes astern, Francesco Constantino and White Tornado. The Italian ace is a great friend and admirer of Arano, the quiet American. There is a high mutual regard between the two and in this race, each knew before the start that the other was the man to beat. The crowd, kept informed by public address commentary, sensed an epic achievement and had cheered little melodrama through third, ahead of Maltese Magnum twin. But John Kennelly still had the outboard in sight and was resolved to fight back on the return leg across line there. Powell and Barclay, with the Max Aitken's young son aboard UFO, were enjoying themselves hugely in fifth place. Timo Mäkinen had Avenger 2 lying sixth. Acknowledged as the world's finest rally driver, the popular Finn is now rapidly becoming a major figure in the international powerboat scene. For the young Gardiner cousins, a setback. They had to bring Delta into Torquay when lying eighth to take on five gallons of oil. Two crafts pursue a collision course for the Torquay mark. Playing chicken at speeds in excess of 60 miles an hour in open water falls for cool nerves and a steady hand on the helm. As the cigarette skimmed and leapt past Portland Bill, she passed Commander Thornycroft's pilot cutter type yacht Horatia, still outward bound. But if the outright victory seemed a certainty, not so the diesel prize. The Max Aitken and Gypsy Girl were only seconds ahead of the pursuing Edward Greenall and Jeep. It was a dice which makes precisely the point of having worthwhile class prizes in any race. Viva Tridanti was hopping on home. Back into the cell and it hurt, and under the watchful eyes of her American mechanic Norris House, Cigarette's thousand horsepower twin McCruders had never missed a beat.
Many spectators did not believe it possible that the leading boat of the fleet they had seen leave for Torquay only three and a half hours before could be back so soon. The world champion had done it again. The combination of Don Arano, Norris House, Clive Curtis and the cigarette had made mincemeat of the finest entry ever in the history of the Cows Torquay race. The gallant Constantino, his partner Mike Vandenberg and White Tornado took the gun 12 minutes astern of the winner. They'd done their best, but it just wasn't good enough. The crowded cows may not have seen a close finish, but they had certainly seen powerboat racing history in the making. But Tornado, the 31-footer designed by Russell Specht and built by Bertrams, had been the only serious competitor for the Arano-designed cigarette built by Carey Marine. Constantino's congratulations to Arano revealed no trace of disappointment. That man, he said, is fantastic. But behind the first two home, incredible changes of fortune were taking place. John Kennelly's Maltese Magnum only succeeded in snatching third place from John Gallifet when melodrama damaged the bottom end of her port outboard to be disastrous this low. Hans Stenboker's Tamashanto also profited by the misfortunes of others to finish sixth. Poor Tim Powell and Norman Barkley, fifth at Portland on the run-in with UFO, limped home with stripped gears on a V-drive in an inglorious 27th place. And Timo Markinen had a steering yoke give way on Avenger 2, enabling Telstar to snatch what seemed his certain fifth place at Hertz. For Maurice Hardy, who had bought Telstar, last year's winner from Tommy Sopwith, a fine first time out and an exciting last-minute fourth place at the Cow's line. John Hobart's Snoopy, powered by a car engine, also finished well. And a fabulous run-in for Black Panther, who gained six places to 12th on the run up the set. John Kennelly and Maltese Magnum then third, 54 minutes, no less, behind the winner, their average 53 miles an hour. First, cigarette. Second, white tornado. Third, Maltese Magnum Twin. Fourth, Telstar. Fifth, Melodrama. And Sir Max Aitken won the Diesel Prize after all. To Don Arano, the applause, the principal prize of the Beaver Book Trophy and the Thousand Times, and, appropriately, the last word. The reason we made this fast speed was that uh, uh, Charles and Timmy Gardner with that long ski on the front of their boat said if we didn't get out of the way they were going to get our trap. <laughs> Thank you again. Well,